All right, chapter 34, Environmental Emergencies. And we're gonna go straight to the intro. Um, an environmental emergency is a medical condition caused by an exacerbation. Um, start that over. An environmental emergency is a medical condition caused or exacerbated by weather terrain or atmospheric pressure at high altitude or underwater. Temperature and atmospheric pressure can overwhelm the body's mechanisms for regulating temperature. A variety of medical emergencies can result, particularly in children, older people, people with chronic illnesses, or young adults who overexert themselves. The environmental effect on morbidity and mortality increases with stressors that induce or exacerbate other medical or traumatic conditions. A range of medical emergencies also arise from water recreation. As an advanced emergency medical technician, you can save lives by recognizing and responding properly to emergencies. Factors affecting exposure. The body works to ensure balance between heat production and heat excretion. This is thermoregulation. A rise in core body temperature elicits responses that increase heat loss and shut off normal heat production pathways called thermogenesis. A decrease in core body temperature prompts heat production and conservation and turns off normal heat liberating pathways that is called thermolysis. Factors affecting exposure include physical condition, age, nutrition and hydration, environmental conditions, heat stroke cases occur when the temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity is 80%. So almost every day in Alabama. Uh, cold exposure, normal body temperature must be maintained within a narrow range for the body's chemistry to work efficiently. Homeostasis must be obtained, maintained Cold exposure may cause injury to individual parts of the body or to the whole body. Hypothermia is the entire core body temperature falls because of inadequate internal heat production, thermogenesis, uh, excess cold stress, or a combination of both. Through thermolysis or methods of heat loss, the body can lose heat in the following five ways, conduction, convection, evaporation, radiation, and respiration. The rate and amount of heat loss or gain by the body can be modified in three ways, increase or decrease heat production, move to an area where heat loss is decreased or increased, and wear the appropriate clothing for the environment. This figure shows a wind chill factor table. I'm sure you're wondering why that's important to you. Uh, this shows a heat index table for the future James plans. Uh, pathophysiology, hypothermia, occurs when the core body temperature of the body falls below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The body cannot regulate its temperature and generate body heat. The body normally constricts blood vessels in the skin. Many body functions begin to slow down as cold exposure continues. It can develop either quickly or gradually. The temperature does not have to be below freezing for hypothermia to occur. More common among geriatric, pediatric, and the ill populations. Alcohol is a common contributor to hypothermia. Impaired thermoregulation can occur with therapeutic use or overdoses of sedative medications. Signs and symptoms, um, these increase in severity as the core temperature falls. Hypothermia generally progresses through four stages. These are shown in Table 34.1. It is important to assess the temperature of the patient's skin close to the trunk or core of the body. Rectal temperature is considered the most accurate for assessment of hypothermia. Hypothermia thermometer registers lower core temperatures. Mild hypothermia occurs when the core temperature is between 95 and 93 degrees. Moderate hypothermia exists when the core temperature is 92 to 89 degrees. As the core temperature drops toward 85 degrees, the patient becomes lethargic. If the core temperature continues to fall to 80 degrees, vital signs slow. 
at the core temperature of at the core temperature of less than 80 degrees, all cardio respiratory activity may cease. Never assume that a cold, pulseless patient is dead. Patients are not dead until they are what? Warm and dead. Warm and dead. Warm and dead. Local cold injuries. Injuries from cold are localized to exposed parts of the body. In systemic hypothermia, blood is shunted away from the extremities to maintain the core temperature. Remember that both local and systemic cold exposure injuries can occur at the, in the same patient. Injuries such as frost nip, uh, chill blains. Okay, we're going to go with chill blains. Or immersion foot can result when exposed parts of the body become very cold but not frozen. Frost nip and immersion foot. Frost nip often affects the ears, nose, and fingers and is not painful. Immersion foot occurs after prolonged exposure to cold water. The skin is pale, blanched, and cold to the touch. Frostbite tissues are frozen, permanently damages the cells via direct cellular damage or progressive dermal ischemia. If gangrene occurs, the dead tissue must be surgically removed. This can be identified by the hard, waxy feel of the affected tissues. As with the burn, the depth of skin damage will vary. Assessment of cold injuries. Management consists of stabilizing the ABCs and preventing further heat loss. All patients who are injured are at risk for hypothermia. Keep this in mind when you are evaluating a patient with multiple injuries. Your scene size up, scene safety, scene assessment begins with information provided by dispatch and consideration of the environmental conditions. The following are important aspects of the scene size up, the air temp, windshield, and whether it is wet or dry. Ensure that the scene is safe for you and other responders. Identify potential safety hazards such as wet grass, mud, snow, or icy streets. Consider special hazards such as avalanches. Uh, cold environments may present special problems. Use appropriate standard precautions, including dressing appropriately for the weather. Consider the number of patients you may have. Summon additional help as quickly as possible. The mechanism of injury, nature of illness. Look for indicators of the MOI. It helps you develop an early index of suspicion for underlying injuries. A primary survey. For my general impression, the chief complaint may be only that he or she is cold. Uh, there may be complication of the existing medical problem or trauma. Perform a rapid full body scan to determine whether a life threat exists, and if so, treat it. If the chief complaint is simply being cold, quickly assess the patient's core temperature. Evaluate the patient's mental status quickly using the IFPU scale. An altered mental status can be affected by the intensity of the cold injury. Your assessment should take into account the physiologic changes that occur as a result of hypothermia. Airway and breathing. If you believe the patient is in cardiac arrest, proceed directly to the circulation step by providing high quality chest compressions. Address airway and breathing afterward. If you cannot feel a radial pulse, gently palpate for a carotid pulse and wait for up to 60 seconds before you decide that the patient is pulseless. Some recommend that CPR may be delayed or suspended in severe hypothermia. CPR, when performed correctly, will increase blood flow to critical parts. Perfusion will be compromised based on the severity of cold exposure. Ensure that the patient has an adequate airway and is breathing. If your patient's breathing is slow or shallow, ventilation with a back mask device may be necessary. If available, warm, humidified oxygen helps warm the patient from the inside out.
Even mild hypothermia can have serious consequences and complications. All patients with hypothermia require immediate transport for evaluation and treatment. Assess the scene for the safest way to quickly move your patient from the cold environment. Gentle transportation is necessary. Transport the patient with the head level or slightly down. Call in your radio report as soon as possible. If transportation is delayed, protect the patient from further heat loss. History taking. Investigate the chief complaint. Obtain a medical history. Be alert for injury specific signs and symptoms as well as any pertinent negatives. If possible, determine the duration of the exposure, the temperature to which the body part was exposed, and the wind velocity. Sample history, uh, this can provide important information affecting both your treatment in the field and the treatment your patient will receive in the hospital. The patient's last oral intake and activity prior to the exposure will help to determine the severity of the cold injury. You should also investigate several underlying factors, exposure to wet conditions, inadequate insulation from cold or wind, restricted circulation from tight clothing or shoes or circulatory disease, fatigue, inadequate nutrition, alcohol or drug abuse, hypothermia, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and age. Secondary assessment is used to uncover injuries missed during the primary assessment. Focus your physical examination on the severity of hypothermia. Determine the degree and extent of cold injury. A careful examination of your patient's entire body with special attention to skin temperature, texture, and turgor is crucial. Vital signs may be altered by the effects of hypothermia. Respirations may be slow and shallow. Low blood pressure and a slow pulse indicate moderate to severe hypothermia. Determine a core body temperature using a hypothermia thermometer based on local protocol. Pulse oximetry will often be inaccurate because of the lack of perfusion in the extremities. Reassessment, reassess the vital signs and achieve complaint. Review all treatments that have been performed. Keep a close eye on your patient's level of consciousness and vital signs. Be vigilant and monitor your patient closely. Communicate all information gathered to the receiving facility. Um, this is not really going to affect you, but just FYI so that you know and understand when it says that um, a calm transport of the patient is necessary. And that is due to patients that are uh, hypothermic are at a very high risk for um, cardiac dysrhythmias. So the least little bump of that patient can put them into um, an irregular cardiac rhythm. Okay. So just a FYI so that you understand if you are transporting a hypothermic patient, it's not really going to affect you because you're not going to be doing cardiac monitoring, but just so you know, that is why that is. All right. Emergency medical care for cold emergencies. The following are general steps to take promptly to prevent further cold injury. Remove wet clothing and keep the patient dry. Uh, prevent conduction heat loss. Move the patient away from any wet or cold surfaces such as a car frame. Insulate all exposed body parts, especially the head, by wrapping them in a blanket or any other available dry bulky material. Prevent convection heat loss by erecting a wind barrier around the patient. Remove the patient from the cold environment as promptly as possible. In most cases, move the patient from the cold environment to prevent further heat loss. To prevent further damage to the feet, do not allow the patient to walk. Remove any wet or frozen clothing and place dry blankets over and under the patient. If available, give the patient warm humidified oxygen. Obtain IV access, but follow local protocols for administering fluid to a patient with hypothermia. When possible, administer fluid that has been warmed. Handle the patient gently to avoid pain or further injury to the skin. 
Do not massage the extremities. Do not allow the patient to eat or use any stimulants. Mild hypothermia. Signs and symptoms are alertness, shivering, responds appropriately, core body temp between 90 and 95. Your treatment is to begin passive rewarming slowly. Turn the heat up in the patient compartment of the ambulance. Use caution to avoid burns and rewarm the patient slowly. If possible, give warm fluids by mouth. Moderate to severe hypothermia. Active rewarming is best accomplished in the emergency room. Rewarming should occur rapidly. Rewarming extremities too rapidly without rewarming the core can cause vasodilation. Local protocols may dictate the appropriate type of rewarming strategy. If you cannot get the patient out of the cold immediately, move the patient out of the wind and away from contact with any object that will conduct heat away from the body. Remember that even an unresponsive patient may be able to hear you. Uh, withholding and cessation of resuscitative efforts. If submersion preceded the arrest, then successful resuscitation is unlikely. Trauma, alcohol overdose, and drug overdose could have resulted in hypothermia. Try to factor these conditions into your treatment decisions and seek medical control input. The effects of hypothermia may essentially protect the brain and organs if hypothermia develops quickly. It is prudent to attempt resuscitation to determine which came first, or cardiac arrest and then hypothermia or vice versa. Fixed dilated pupils, apparent rigor mortis, and dependent lividity are not contraindications for resuscitation of a severely hypothermic patient. Emergency medical care of local cold injuries. Emergency treatment of local cold injuries in the field should include the following steps. Remove the patient from further exposure to the cold. Handle the injured part gently and protect it from further injury. Administer oxygen. Remove any wet or restricting clothing over the injured part. If there's no chance of re-injury to a more superficial local cold injury, consider active rewarming. With frost nip, contact with a warm object may be all that is needed. The affected part will often tingle and become red in light-skinned people. With immersion foot, remove wet shoes, boots, and socks. Splint the extremity and cover it loosely with dry, sterile dressing. Never rub injured tissues. Do not re-expose the injury to cold. With a later deep cold injury, be sure to remove any jewelry or other potentially restrictive items from the injured part. Cover the injury loosely with a dry sterile dressing. Do not break blisters or rub or massage the area. Do not apply heat or rewarm the part. Rewarming of the frostbitten extremity is best accomplished under controlled circumstances in the ED. Never apply something warm or hot, such as exhaust from an ambulance engine or an open flame. Do not, I'm sorry, they put that in there, so somebody somewhere has done that. Uh, do not allow the patient to stand or walk on a frostbitten foot. Evaluate for signs or symptoms of systemic hypothermia. Support vital functions as necessary and transport the patient promptly to the hospital. Rewarming in the field. If prompt hospital care is not available and medical control instructs you to institute rewarming in the field, use a warm water bath. Immerse the frostbitten part in water with a temperature of between 100 and 105 degrees. Check the water temperature with a thermometer before immersing the limb. Recheck the temperature frequently during the rewarming process. The water temperature should never exceed 105 degrees Fahrenheit or 40.5 degrees Celsius. Stir the water continuously. Keep the frostbitten part in the water until it feels warm and sensation has returned to the skin. Dress the area with dry, sterile dressings, including between injured fingers or toes. Expect the patient to report severe pain. You may consider administering nitrous oxide or calling for paramedic backup to administer analgesics. 
Never a temp rewarming if there's any chance that the part may freeze again before the patient reaches the hospital. Some of the most severe consequences of frostbite have occurred when parts were thawed and then refrozen. Cover the frostbitten part with soft padded sterile cotton dressings. If blisters have formed, do not break them. You cannot accurately predict the outcome of a case of frostbite early in its course. Go ahead. Okay, so it said, you said we're warming in a, a, like a warm bath, but thing is, like, how would we actually go about doing that? Because say they're outside in the cold, say it's like snowing or whatever, they're walking around, we don't have access to that. No, and this is one of the things that um, you're learning right now on a national level. This is the past national registry, and um, this is not state protocol specific. So you're going to learn things that are going to be relevant to people in Alaska, uh, not Alabama or Florida. Um, the few times we have had snow um, to where a patient would be that hypothermic, um, most people stay inside. But let's just say for sake of argument, you do have, because it is possible to have a patient that is frostbitten. Um, that would be a case of um, if you're in an area, like, okay, if you're outside a patient's residence um, and medical control orders you to do that, then you could do that inside the patient's home. Um, if you're not in an area where or on a scene that you would have access to that, then you're just going to transport. Okay. Yeah. So um, a lot of this stuff is not going to make sense because it is a national level. Um, so a lot of this stuff you're never, ever going to have to worry about. But you have to know it to pass the, your national register test. So, yeah, if you have access to it and they order it, then absolutely they let you improvise. Well, that's why we're ditch doctors. But um, if it's not something that you have access to, then you're just going to explain to medical control, hey, I don't have access to that. This is our ETA and you're going to transport. All right. Um, cold exposure and you. You are also at risk for hypothermia if you work in a cold environment. If cold weather search and rescue operations are a possibility in your area, then you need survival training and precautionary tips. Be thoroughly familiar with local conditions. Be aware of existing and potential weather conditions. Stay on top of weather forecasts. Make sure to wear proper clothing whenever appropriate. Your vehicle must also be properly equipped and maintained. You cannot help others if you do not practice self-protection. Heat exposure. Normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Complicated regulatory mechanisms keep this internal temperature constant regardless of the ambient temperature. When the body itself... Do I? completely black. I'm going to... Go out and come back in and see if that helps. All right, I'll pause. Mm -hmm. Hold on. <clears throat> That's a Stacy issue. Hang on. How about now? Hey, I'm good. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Um, when the body itself produces excess heat, it will try to rid itself of the excess heat through thermolysis. The two most efficient methods to decrease heat are sweating and dilation of peripheral blood vessels. When the body is exposed to or generates more heat energy than it can lose because of an inadequate thermolysis, hyperthermia can result. Hyperthermia is a high core temperature, usually 101 degrees or higher. 
The patho, when the body's mechanisms to decrease body heat are overwhelmed, illness develops. High air temperature can reduce the body's ability to lose heat by radiation. High humidity reduces the ability to lose heat through evaporation. Vigorous exercise causes loss of fluid and electrolytes. Illness from heat exposure can cause the following problems. Heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and all three forms may be present in the same patient. Heat exhaustion may progress to heat stroke. Persons at greatest risk for heat illnesses are children, geriatric patients, patients with heart disease, COPD, diabetes, dehydration, and obesity. Patients with limited mobility, alcohol and certain drugs also make a person more susceptible to heat illnesses. Contributing factors include length of exposure, intensity of exposure, and the environment itself. Preventative measures to protect from heat emergencies, maintaining an adequate fluid intake, uh, acclimatize to the environment, limit exposure, drink water continually. People working outside in high temperatures should drink water continually to replace what is lost through perspiration. Table 34.2 compares the conditions resulting from heat stress. Heat cramps, they are painful muscle cramps that occur after vigorous exercise. They do not occur only when it is hot outdoors. The exact cause is not well understood. Dehydration may also have a role in the development of muscle cramps. Heat cramps usually occur in the legs or abdominal muscles. Heat exhaustion is also called heat prostration or heat collapse. It's the most common serious illness caused by heat. Result of the body losing so much water and so many electrolytes through very heavy sweating that hypovolemia or fluid depletion occurs. For sweating to be an effective cooling mechanism, sweat must be able to evaporate from the body. Signs and symptoms, onset while working vigorously or exercising in a hot, humid, or poorly ventilated environment and sweating heavily. Onset, even at rest, in the older and infant age groups in hot, humid, and poorly ventilated environments. Cold, clammy skin with ashen pallor. Dry tongue and thirst. Dizziness, weakness, or faintness with accompanying nausea or headache. Normal vital signs. Normal or slightly elevated body temperature. Maybe a subtle increase in core body temperature with some neurologic deficit. Symptoms may be solely a result of dehydration combined with overexertion. The result is hypotension. Symptoms that do not resolve with rest and positioning may be the result of the increased body, core body temperature. Heat stroke. This is the least common but most serious illness caused by heat exposure. It occurs when the body is subjected to more heat than it can effectively remove and normal mechanisms for getting rid of the excess heat are overwhelmed. Body temperature rises rapidly to a level at which tissues are destroyed. Heat stroke can develop in patients during vigorous physical activity or when they are outdoors or in a closed, poorly ventilated human space. Many patients with heat stroke have hot, dry, flush skin. Do not rule out heat stroke even if the patient's skin is moist. Keep in mind that a patient can have a heat stroke even if he or she is still sweating. The minute someone is detected to be having a heat injury, consider that other personnel wearing similar gear or performing similar duties are likely to also have heat injury. The first sign of heat stroke is a change in behavior. One of the telltale signs you should be acutely aware of is when your patient no longer perspires. Classic heat stroke commonly presents in people with chronic illnesses. Um, exertional heat stroke commonly presents in people who are in good general health but have an increased core body temperature because of overwhelming heat stress. Recovery from heat stroke depends on the speed in which treatment is administered. Assessment of heat injuries or seen size up, perform an environmental assessment. Dispatch may report the call initially as a medical or trauma emergency. Approach the scene looking for hazards as well as clues as to what may have caused the emergency. Use appropriate standard precautions. Look for indicators of MOI. 
Hate emergencies commonly occur in the context of athletic events and practices. It is harmful to allow heat to persist for any amount of time. Overcooling can result in shivering, which generates more heat. Primary survey, observe how the patient interacts with you in the environment, perform a rapid full body scan and avoid tunnel vision, assess the patient's mental status using the IFPO scale, assess the patient's airway and breathing, position the patient to protect the airway as necessary. <coughs> if the patient is unresponsive, be cautious how you open the airway. Consider spinal precautions if trauma is a possibility. Providing oxygen to the patient will assist with the perfusion of body tissues and may decrease nausea. Assess the patient's circulation by palpating a pulse and then feeling the skin. Table 34.3 lists three skin conditions. Treat the patient aggressively for shock. If your patient has any signs of heat stroke, transport without delay to the closest appropriate facility. History taking, obtain a medical history, be alert for specific signs and symptoms. Obtaining a thorough patient history of the present illness can help differentiate between a fever and a heat emergency. Obtain a sample history, be thorough in your questioning, determine your patient's exposure to heat and humidity and activities prior to the onset of symptoms. Secondary assessment, it uncovers injuries that may have been missed during the primary survey. If your patient is unresponsive, perform a physical exam of the entire body. Obtain the patient's vital signs. If the patient is alert, perform a focused assessment. Assess the patient for muscle cramps or confusion. Examine the patient's mental status and obtain the patient's vital signs. Perform a careful neurologic examination. Patients with hyperthermia will often be tachycardic and tachypneic. Your assessment of the patient's skin will help determine the severity of the emergency. Check the patient's temperature with a thermometer depending on protocol. Oral temperature can be misleading if the patient just ingested a cool drink. Reassessment, watch your patient's condition carefully for deterioration. Monitor the patient's vital signs at least every five minutes. Evaluate the effectiveness of your interventions. Be careful not to cause shivering when cooling down a patient who is experiencing a heat emergency. Inform the staff at the receiving facility early on that your patient is experiencing a heat stroke. Document the weather conditions and the activities the patient was performing prior to the emergency in your patient care report. Emergency medical care for heat emergency, heat cramps. Take the following steps to treat heat cramps in the field. Remove the patient from the hot environment. Administer high flow oxygen if indicated. Rest the cramping muscles. Replace fluids by mouth. Cool the patient with water spray or mist and add convection by manually or mechanically fanning the patient. When the heat cramps are gone, the patient may resume activity. Heavy sweating may cause cramps to recur. The best preventative and treatment strategy is hydration by drinking water. If the cramps do not go away after these measures, initiate an IV line and transport the patient to the hospital. If you are uncertain that the cramps were caused by heat or you know anything out of the ordinary, contact medical control or transport to the hospital. Heat exhaustion. To treat the patient with heat exhaustion, follow steps in skill drill 34-1. The treatment is aimed at removing the patient from exposure to heat and urgently reversing the increase in body temperature through active cooling efforts. If an ice bath or similar facility is available, provide cold water immersion to the patient if allowed. Prepare to transport the patient to the hospital for more aggressive treatment, especially in the following circumstances. The symptoms do not clear up promptly. The level of consciousness decreases, the body temperature remains elevated, or the person is very young, older, or has any underlying medical condition. Heat stroke. Recovery from heat stroke depends on the speed with which the treatment is administered. Take the following steps when treating a patient with heat stroke. Move the patient out of the hot environment and into the ambulance. Set the air conditioning to maximum cooling. Remove the patient's clothing and administer oxygen if indicated. 
Cover the patient with wet towels or sheets or spray the patient with cool water and fan him or her to quickly evaporate the moisture on the skin. Obtain IV access and administer a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus of an isotonic crystalloid solution, repeating as needed. Provide immediate transport to the hospital. Notify the hospital as soon as possible so that the staff can prepare to treat the patient immediately on arrival. Water emergencies. Drowning. Drowning is the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in liquid. Patients with submersion injury can die of secondary complications that occur beyond 24 hours. Drowning is often the last in a cycle of events caused by panic in the water. Inhaling very small amounts of fresh or salt water can severely irritate the larynx, resulting in laryngospasm. Laryngospasm prevents more water from entering the lungs. Hypothermia is also a major consideration in submersion. The body's diving reflex may actually slow metabolism to the point of protecting vital organs. Hypoxia is always the first concern, but all submersion victims should be treated for hypothermia. Diving emergencies. Most serious water-related injuries are associated with dives with or without scuba gear. Some of these problems are related to the nature of the dive. Others result from panic. Panic can even happen to an experienced diver or swimmer. General pathophysiology, physical principles of pressure effects. Pressure may be expressed in several ways. Measurement in ATA is, almost, is most commonly used in diving medicine. Most scuba diving is done at depths between 30 and 60 FSW or 2 to 3 ATA. Liquids such as water are not compressible. Gases are compressible and follow several physical laws. The Boyle's Law, at a constant temperature, the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to its pressure. Dalton's law, each gas in the mixture exerts the same partial pressure that it would exert if it were alone in the same volume. Henry's law is the amount of gas dissolved in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above the liquid. This law explains decompression sickness or what is called the bends. Per Boyle's law, the volume of nitrogen decreases as pressure increases. Per Henry's law, as pressure decreases during ascent, nitrogen comes out of the solution in the blood. Dive tables and dive computers provide guidelines for divers regarding when to take decompression stops during the dive. General assessment diving history is important for you to obtain as many details as you can about the dive and the onset of the patient's symptoms. It is helpful to use a special form that records the following information. When did symptoms start? Symptoms occurring within 10 minutes of surfacing suggest an air embolism. What type of diving was done and what type of equipment was used? What type of tank was used? Where is the diving site and what was the water temperature? How many dives were made during the past 72 hours and what were the depth, bottom time, and surface interval for each? Was a dive computer used? Were safety stops used? Were there any attempts at in-water decompression uh, considered risky? Were there any dive complications? And what were the pre-dive and post-dive activities? Descent emergencies. Diving injuries are separated into three phases of the dive, descent, bottom, and ascent. The major problem divers encounter during descent is barotrauma. Barotrauma can result from compression of gases within body spaces during descent or expansion of gases within those spaces during ascent. Table 34.4 summarizes the types of barotrauma. As long as the air-filled cavities of the body can equilibrate freely, they will not implode. Um, this no longer holds true if there is an obstruction. A person with a perforated tympanic membrane or a ruptured eardrum may develop a special problem while diving. Injuries at depth, nitrogen narcosis is a state of altered mental status 
caused by breathing compressed nitrogen containing air at depth. In a breathing gas mixture, nitrogen dilutes the concentration of oxygen. Ascent emergencies. Most of the serious injuries associated with diving are related to ascending from the bottom and are referred to as ascent problems. Usually require aggressive resuscitation. Two particularly dangerous medical emergencies are air embolism and decompression sickness. Pulmonary overpressurization syndrome, or POPS, is a dangerous form of barotrauma that can occur when divers fail to exhale during an ascent. POPS can cause a pneumothorax, mediastinal or subcutaneous emphysema, alveolar hemorrhage, and a lethal air embolism. A small overpressurization can be sufficient to rupture alveoli. People with COPD and asthma are at a slightly increased risk. When alveoli rupture, the signs and symptoms depend partly on where the escaping air ends up. Physical examination may reveal palpable subcutaneous air above the clavicles. Always look for unequal breath sounds, low pulse oximetry values, and hyperresonance on the affected side of the chest. The pre-hospital treatment of a patient with pulmonary barotrauma depends on whether the patient has an air embolism. A pneumothorax may require needle decompression or a chest tube. Air embolism, a condition involving bubbles of air in the blood vessels. The air pressure in the lungs remains at a high level with the external pressure on the chest decreases. Air inside the lungs expand rapidly. The air released from this rupture can cause the following injuries. Air may enter the pleural space and compress the lungs. Air may enter the mediastinum. Air may enter the bloodstream and create emboli. Pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum both result in pain and severe dyspnea. The following are potential signs and symptoms of air embolism. Blotching, which is modeling of the skin. Froth, which is often pink or bloody at the nose and mouth, severe pain in muscles, joints, or abdomen, dyspnea, localized, pleuritic, sharp chest pain, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting, dysphagia, which is difficulty speaking, cough, cyanosis, difficulty with vision, paralysis, and or coma, and irregular pulse, and even cardiac arrest. Decompression sickness occurs when bubbles of gas obstruct the blood vessels. It results from too rapid an ascent from a dive, too long of a dive at too deep of a depth, or repeated dives within a short period. The most striking symptom is abdominal and or joint pain. Dive tables and small diving computers are available to calculate and record the proper rate of ascent from a dive. A sudden decrease of external pressure on the body and release of dissolved nitrogen from the blood that forms bubbles of nitrogen gas within the blood vessels. Uh, it's difficult to distinguish between air embolism and decompression sickness. Air embolism occurs immediately on return to the surface. Symptoms of decompression sickness may not occur for several hours. Treatment consists of basic life support, including oxygen administration, monitoring and transport, followed by recompression in a hyperbaric chamber. Recompression treatment allows the bubbles of gas to dissolve into the blood and equalizes the pressures inside and outside of the lungs. <clears throat> Water rescue. Rescue and removal of a patient matters first. The basic rules of water rescue are first try to reach for the patient. If that does not work, then throw the patient a rope, a life preserver, or any floatable object that is available. Next, use a boat if one is available. Do not attempt a swimming rescue unless it doesn't say unless what. Um, be prepared for rapid hypothermia in cold environment. If you work in a recreation area near a water body, you should have a pre-arranged plan for water rescue. Okay, um, it doesn't, it says do not attempt a swimming rescue unless, um, and then it doesn't. Do you want me to read it from the book? Go ahead. It says uh, do not attempt a swimming rescue unless you are trained and experienced in the proper techniques. Very good. Why is this? 
they are conscious, they can drag you down. A drowning person will drown you. They are panicking. They are scared. Um, they are grasping for anything they can reach. And if that is you, they will take you under. No matter how good of a swimmer you are. Um, people that are panicking and facing life and death situations have superhuman strength. They can lift cars and they can drown you. So you do not attempt a rescue unless you are trained to do so. Amen. Okay. <laughs> We're going to pray for Tiffany. Tiffany has to wear a life vest at all times now. Uh, for colder areas, a plan for ice rescue is also necessary. The success of any water rescue depends on how rapidly the patient is removed from the water and ventilated. Ensure to get immediate access to personal flotation devices and other rescue equipment. Spinal injuries and submersion incidents. Submersion incidents may be complicated by spinal fractures and spinal cord injuries. Assume that spinal injury exists with the following conditions. The submersion has resulted from a diving mishap um, or fall from a substantial height. The patient is unresponsive and no information is available to rule out the possibility of a neck injury. The patient is responsive but reports weakness, paralysis, numbness, or tingling in the arms or legs. You suspect the possibility of a spinal injury despite what witnesses say. Stabilize the suspected injury while the patient is still in the water. To stabilize a suspected spinal injury in the water, follow steps in skill drill 34, what are you doing? Uh, 34 to. Okay, y'all pause for two seconds. My computer's about to die. Okay. Next slide. Recovery techniques. An organized rescue effort calls for providers who are experienced with recovery techniques and equipment, including snorkel, mask, and scuba gear. Patient assessment of drowning and diving emergencies, scene size up, scene safety. Your standard precautions should include gloves and eye protection at a minimum. Check for hazards to your crew. Never drive through moving water. Use extreme caution driving through standing water. Never attempt a water rescue without the proper training and equipment. Call for additional resources early. If the patient is still in water, look for the best, safest means of removal. Trauma and spinal mobilization, sorry, stabilization, must be considered in recreational settings. Check for additional patients depending upon the situation. Primary assessment, form a general impression. Assess life threats and determine whether spinal stabilization is necessary. Pay attention to chest pain, dyspnea, and complaints of sensory changes when a diving emergency is suspected. Determine the patient's level of consciousness using the IFPO scale. Be suspicious of alcohol use and its effects on the patient's level of consciousness. Airway and breathing. Open the airway and assess breathing in unresponsive patients. Take into consideration the possibility of spinal trauma and take appropriate actions. Suction according to protocol if the patient has vomited or if pink frothy secretions are found in the airway. Do not spend substantial amounts of time trying to clear foam from the airway. Provide ventilations with a bag mask device for inadequate breathing. Use an airway adjunct to facilitate bag mask device ventilations as necessary. If the patient is responsive, provide high flow oxygen with a non-rebreathing mask. If there is no risk of spinal injury, position the patient to protect the airway from aspiration in the event of vomiting. Obtain and continually monitor breath sounds in drowning patients. This is the key part of your assessment. Oh no.
my laptop has decided to time out and just spam. Okay, I was afraid I lost all that. I was going to die. A transport decision. Even if resuscitation in the field appears successful, always transport patients to the hospital. Symptoms may not appear for 24 hours or more after resuscitation. Inhalation of any amount of fluid can lead to delay complications lasting for days or weeks. Decompression sickness and air embolism must be treated in a recompression chamber. Perform all interventions en route to the nearest ED for stabilization. History taking. Obtain a medical history. Be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms, as well as any pertinent negatives. Obtain a sample history with special attention to the dive parameters. Note any physical activity, alcohol, drug consumption, and other medical conditions. Secondary assessment, if the patient is responsive, focus your physical exam on the basis of the chief complaint and the history obtained. Serious drowning situations typically result in an unresponsive patient. It is important to begin with a rapid full body scan. Pay attention to whether your patient is getting adequate ventilation and oxygenation. Check for signs of hypothermia. Obtain a baseline Glasgow Coma Scale score to assess the patient's neurologic status and thinking. Complete a detailed full body exam en route to the hospital. Monitor the patient for respiratory, circulatory, and neurologic compromise. Assess for peripheral pulses, skin color and discoloration, itching, pain, and paresthesia. Check the patient's vital signs. Check carefully for both peripheral and central pulses. Listen over the chest for a heartbeat if pulses are weak. Remember that oxygen saturation readings may produce a false low reading. Reassessment, repeat the primary assessment, reassess vital signs in the chief complaint, recheck patient interventions, call early for paramedic backup if a definitive airway is needed, assess your patient's mental status constantly and assess vital signs at least every five minutes. Pay particular attention to respirations and breath sounds, Document the circumstances of the drowning and extrication, and be sure to document the disposition of any equipment. Emergency care for drowning or diving emergencies. Patients should be kept warm. Provide blankets and protection from the environment as needed. Obtain IV access and do not delay transport by attempting IV access. When treating responsive patients who are suspected of having air embolism or decompression sickness, follow these accepted treatment steps. Remove the patient from the water. Try to keep the patient calm. Administer oxygen via non-rebreathing mask or bag mask device assist. <clears throat> Place the patient in a left lateral recumbent position with a head down. Consider the possibility of a pneumothorax and monitor the patient's breath sounds for development of a tension pneumothorax. Provide prompt transport to the ED. Submerged vehicle incidents. The safest time to escape from a submerging vehicle is immediately after it enters the water. A sequence of steps has been established to ensure that occupants in a submerging vehicle prioritize egress strategies. Attempt to remove the passengers from the vehicle as quickly as possible. Other water hazards, pay close attention to the body temperature of a person who is rescued from cold water. Treat hypothermia caused by immersion in cold water the same way you would treat hypothermia caused by cold exposure. Prevent further heat loss from contact with the ground, stretcher, or air and transport the patient promptly. Breath holding syncope, a person swimming in shallow water may experience a loss of consciousness caused by a decreased stimulus for breathing. It happens to swimmers who breathe in and out rapidly and deeply before entering the water. Hyperventilation lowers the carbon dioxide level. The swimmer may not feel the need to breathe even after using up all of the oxygen in his or her lungs. Treatment is the same as that for drowning or submersion. 
Injuries caused by water hazards may be complicated by immersion in cold water. Injuries from boat propellers, sharp rocks, water skis, or dangerous marine life. Treatment is remove the patient from the water, take care to protect the spine, administer oxygen, apply dressings and splints if indicated, monitor the patient closely for any signs of immersion or cold injury, and remember that a child who is involved in a drowning or submersion may be the victim of child abuse. Handle according to laws regarding suspected child abuse. Prevention. So appropriate precautions can prevent most immersion incidents. All pools should be surrounded by a fence at least six feet high with slats three inches apart or less and self-closing, self-locking gates. The most common problem is lack of adult supervision. As a healthcare provider, be involved with public education to make people aware of hazards. High altitude, uh, dysphorism injuries, any signs and symptoms caused by the difference between the surrounding atmospheric pressure and the total gas pressure in various tissues, fluids, and cavities of the body. Altitude illness occurs when an unacclimated person is exposed to diminished oxygen pressures in the air at high altitudes. It affects the central nervous system and pulmonary system. Acute mountain sickness caused by diminished oxygen pressure in the air at altitudes over 5,000 feet. It results in diminished oxygen in the blood, hypoxia. Signs and symptoms are headache, lightheadedness, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, difficulty sleeping, shortness of breath during physical exertion, and swollen face. High altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE can occur at altitudes of 8,000 feet or greater. Fluid collects in the lungs, hindering the passage of oxygen into the bloodstream. Signs and symptoms are shortness of breath, cough with pink sputum, cyanosis, and rapid pulse. This occurs in climbers who climb above 12,000 feet, may accompany hate, and can quickly become life-threatening. I'm sorry, this is now HACE, high altitude cerebral edema, HACE, occurs in climbers who climb above 12,000 feet. It may accompany hate and can quickly become life-threatening. Symptoms of haste and hate may overlap. Severe constant throbbing headache, ataxia, which is lack of muscle coordination, extreme fatigue, vomiting, and loss of consciousness. Treatment is provide oxygen, descend from the height, transport the patient, and if local protocols allow continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP may be very helpful. Lightning injuries. Approximately 35 people die from lightning strikes in the United States each year. Most lightning deaths and injuries caused by lightning occur during the summer months when people are enjoying outdoor activities. Lightning strikes when a massive discharge of electricity occurs between two bodies that have different charges. A person, sorry. A stream of current takes the path of least resistance from its origin to its destination. A person need not sustain a direct hit from lightning to be injured. Lightning carries enormous electrical power. The electricity from lightning is direct, not alternating. Lightning injuries tend to resemble blast injuries. Uh, damage occurs to the tympanic membranes of the ears and air-containing internal organs. Uh, muscle damage may occur in the release of myoglobin from injured muscle may jeopardize the kidneys. I got tickled by that picture because that's like a 1982 raw. I'm, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Okay, for the cardiovascular system, lightning acts as a cosmic defibrillator. The phenomenon of someone regaining a pulse after a lightning strike and having respiratory rest is known to result in a secondary cardiac arrest if left untreated. The central nervous system is almost invariably affected by a lightning strike. 
During your assessment, look for not only the entrance wound, but also the exit wound. Uh, lightning injuries are categorized as being mild, moderate, or severe. Immediate threats to life are airway obstruction, respiratory arrest, and cardiac arrest. Y'all still with me? Yes. Yeah. Emergency medical care for lightning injuries. If the electrical storm is ongoing, your first priority is to get any patients and rescuers to a safe place. If you are in an open area and adequate shelter is unavailable, it is important to recognize the signs of an impending lightning strike and take immediate action to protect yourself. If you suddenly feel a tingling sensation or your hair stands on end, the area around you has become charged. Curl up in a ball and squat. Make yourself as small a target as possible. Be aware that the lightning strike is apt to injure more than one person. Determine the number of patients. Reverse triage is focus your efforts on those who are in respiratory or cardiac arrest. Start CPR when necessary. When establishing an airway, keep in mind the possibility of cervical spine injury. Do not hyperextend the neck. Instead, use the draw, draw, jaw thrust maneuver. Minimize the interruption and compressions and push hard and fast with full chest recoil. If severe bleeding is present, control it immediately. Manually stabilize the patient's head in a neutral inline position. If the patient is in respiratory arrest with a pulse, begin immediate bag mask ventilations with 100% oxygen. If you are unable to effectively ventilate the patient with a bag mask device, insert an advanced airway device. Provide full spinal immobilization and transport the patient to the closest appropriate facility. Treatment of lightning injuries can be summarized as follows. Make sure the scene is safe. Move the victim to a safer location if necessary. Priority for treatment goes to patients who are not breathing. Perform CPR as needed. Establish an airway and take cervical spine precautions. Administer supplemental oxygen. Insert a large bore IV catheter and deliver an isotonic crystalloid solution. Wide open to keep the kidneys flushed out. Cover any surface burns with dry, clean dressings. Splint fractures, the rules in table 30, 4, 5 can help avoid lightning injuries. Spider bites, bites and envenomations. <laughs> Spiders are numerous and widespread in the United States. There are many species of spiders. The female black widow spider and the brown recluse spider deliver serious, even life-threatening venom. The spider may still be in the area. Your safety is of paramount importance. The assailant may still be on scene. Black widow spider. The female black widow spider, uh, Latrodectus, is fairly large, measuring approximately two inches across with its legs extended. It's usually black with a distinctive bright red or orange marking in the shape of an hourglass on its abdomen. The female is larger and more toxic than the male. It is found in every state except Alaska. It prefers dry, damp places around buildings and wood piles and among debris. The bite is sometimes overlooked. If the sight becomes numb right away, the patient may not even recall being bitten. Most black widow spider bites cause localized pain and symptoms, including agonizing muscle spasms. A bite on the abdomen may cause muscle spasms so severe that they resemble an acute abdomen condition. The main danger is the venom, which is poisonous to nerve tissues and is neurotoxic. Other systemic symptoms include dizziness, sweating, nausea, vomiting, rashes, tightness in the chest, difficulty breathing, and severe cramps with broad like, sorry, board like rigidity of the abdominal muscles typically develop in 24 hours. Generally, these signs and symptoms subside over 48 hours. A physician can administer a specific antivenom, a serum containing antibodies that counteract the venom. Because of a high incidence of side effects, it, its use is reserved for 
uh, very severe bites, extremely feeble people, or children younger than five years. Black widow bites can be fatal in children. Severe muscle spasms are usually treated in the hospital with IV benzodiazepines such as diazepam, Valium, or lorazepam, Ativan. Emergency treatment consists of BLS for the patient in respiratory distress, cleaning the bite with soap and water, and applying an ice pack to the area. Much more often, the patient will merely require relief from pain. Transport to the emergency department as soon as possible. If possible, safely bring the spider to the hospital or take a photo of the spider with a cell phone and send it to the hospital ahead. Brown recluse spider, uh, the loxosiles, maybe, we'll go with it, is dull brown in color and one inch long. The short-haired body has a violin-shaped mark, brown to yellow in color, on its back. Commonly called the fiddleback spider, the spider is named for its tendency to live in dark areas. Venom is not neurotoxic, but cytotoxic. The bite is not painful at first, but becomes so within hours. Over the next several days, a scab of dead skin, fat, and debris will form and dig into the skin, producing a large ulcer. Bites rarely cause systemic symptoms and signs. It's helpful if you can identify the spider and either safely bring it to the hospital with the patient or take a picture of the spider and send it to the hospital. Okay. Hymenoptera stings? Maybe. Painful but are not a medical emergency. Remove the stinger and if still present, the venom sac. This is best done by using a firm edged item. After the stinger is removed, clean thoroughly with soap and water or an antiseptic solution. Anaphylaxis may occur. The signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis are flushed skin, low blood pressure, and difficulty breathing. The patient can also have swelling to the throat and tongue. This is a dire emergency. If anaphylaxis develops, be prepared to administer epinephrine. Be prepared to support airway and breathing. Snake bites. Uh, fatalities from snake bites in the United States are extremely rare. Of the approximately 115 different species of snakes in the United States, only 19 are venomous. That includes the rattlesnake, copperhead, cottonmouth or water moccasin, and coral snakes. We're not going to worry about uh, all of those names. Um, this figure shows the types of venomous snakes. You have the rattlesnake, copperhead, cottonmouth, and coral snake. Cottonmouths are often rather aggressive. Rattlesnakes are easily provoked. Coral snakes usually bite only when they are being handled. Almost any time you are caring for a patient with a snake bite, another snake or perhaps the same one could come along and create a second victim. Use extreme caution on snake bite calls. Ensure to wear the proper protective equipment for the area. The amount of toxin injected is directly related to toxicity. Only one third of snake bites result in substantial local or systemic injuries. Uh, venomous snakes native to the United States all have hollow fangs in the roof of the mouth that inject the poison from two sacs at the bottom of the head. Non-poisonous snakes can also bite, usually leaving horseshoe-shaped teeth marks. Some poisonous snakes have teeth as well as fangs. A person who has been bitten by any venomous snake needs prompt transport. Notify the hospital as soon as possible if a patient has been bitten by a pit viper or a coral snake. Pit vipers, rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cottonmouths are all pit vipers with triangular shaped flat heads. The pit is a heat sensing organ that allows the snake to strike accurately at any warm target, especially in the dark. 
The fangs of the pit viper normally lie flat against the roof of the mouth. They are hinged to swing back and forth as the mouth opens. When a snake strikes, the mouth opens wide and the fangs extend. The fangs are actually special hollow teeth that act similar to hypodermic needles. The primary purpose of the venom is to kill small animals and to start the digestive process before they are eaten. Different, several different species of rattlesnakes can be identified by the rattle on the tail. When agitated or endangered, rattlesnakes shake their tails or rattles. Copperheads are smaller than rattlesnakes. Cottonmouths grow to approximately four feet in length. They are water snakes with a particularly aggressive pattern of behavior. Tissue distraction from the venom may be severe. Bluish discoloration in light-skinned people occurs. The venom of the pit viper can also interfere with the body's blood clotting mechanisms. Other systemic signs which may or may not occur include weakness, nausea, vomiting, vision problems, seizures, sweating, fainting, changes in LOC, and shock. The smaller the patient, the more severe the symptoms are likely to be with envenomation. If swelling has occurred, use a pen to mark its edges on the skin. Coral snakes, they are small reptiles with a series of bright red, yellow, and black bands completely encircling the body. Only the coral snake has red and yellow bands next to one another. And they are a relative of the cobra. It has tiny fangs and injects the venom with its teeth by a chewing motion. It leaves one or more puncture or scratch-like wounds. It usually bites its victims on a small part of the body. Coral snake venom is a powerful toxin that causes paralysis of the nervous system. Often there are limited or no local symptoms. Treatment of snake bites. The steps for emergency care for a pit viper bite and a coral snake bite are similar. When treating a bite from a pit viper, take the following steps. Calm the patient. Assure him or her that snake bites are rarely fatal. Have the patient lie supine and explain that remaining still and calm will slow the spread of any venom through the system. Determine the approximate time of the bite and document your time en route to a receiving facility. Locate the bite area and clean it gently with soap and water or a mild antiseptic. Do not apply ice. If the bite occurred on an arm or leg, consider the use of a properly performed pressure immobilization bandage of the extremity and then place the affected extremity below the level of the heart. Be alert for an anaphylactic reaction to the venom and treat with an epinephrine auto-injector as appropriate. Do not give anything by mouth. If the patient was bitten on the trunk, keep him or her supine and quiet and transport as quickly as possible. Monitor the patient's vital signs and mark the skin with a pen over the area that is swollen proximal to the swelling. If signs of shock are present, place the patient's supine and administer 100% oxygen. Be prepared to assist ventilations if needed. Initiate IV therapy according to local protocols. If the snake has been killed, bring it with you or take a photo on your cell phone. Notify the hospital that the patient has been bitten by a snake. If possible, describe the snake, transport promptly, and call for paramedic backup if needed. <clears throat> Successful treatment depends on positive identification of the snake in support of vital central nervous system functions. Antivenom is available for coral snake bites, but most hospitals do not stock it. Notify the receiving hospital as soon as possible. If the patient shows no signs of envenomation, provide BLS as needed. Place a sterile dressing over the suspected bite area. Immobilize the injury site. All patients with a suspected snake bite should be taken to the ED whether they show signs of envenomation or not. Scorpion stings. Scorpions are eight-legged arachnids from the biological group Arachnida. Found primarily in the southwestern United States and its deserts. With one exception, the sting of scorpions in the U.S. is usually very painful but not dangerous, causing localized swelling and discoloration. This exception is the sin. Troia, Troia Sculpturatus, that one, whatever that is.
Um, venom may produce a severe systemic reaction that brings about circulatory collapse, severe muscle contractions, excessive salivation, hypertension, seizures, and cardiac failure. Antivenin is available but must be administered by a physician. If you are called to care for a patient with a suspected sting from that one, notify medical control as soon as possible. Administer BLS and provide rapid transport to the ED. Tick bites usually attach themselves directly to the skin. They can easily be mistaken for a freckle. The bite is not painful. The danger is from the infecting organisms that the tick carries. The most common tick-borne diseases are Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, um, Ehrlich, whatever whatever that word is, and tularemia. I'll give up at this point in pronouncing this stuff. This is why Doodle makes me teach it. Tick-borne diseases are spread through the tick saliva. The longer a tick stays embedded, the greater the chance that a disease will be transmitted. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever occurs within seven to 10 days after a bite by an infected tick. Symptoms include nausea, vomiting, headache, weakness, paralysis, and possibly cardiorespiratory collapse. Lyme disease has been reported in all states with the exception of Hawaii. Symptoms include fever, flu-like symptoms, and a rash that may spread to several parts of the body. The rash may eventually resemble a target or bullseye pattern in one-third of patients. It may be confused with rheumatoid arthritis. If treatment promptly, if treated promptly with antibiotics, the patient may recover completely. Tick bites occur most commonly during the summer months. Transmission of the infection from tick to person takes at least 12 hours. Proceed carefully and slowly. Do not attempt to suffocate the tick with gasoline or petroleum jelly or burn it with a lighted match. Use fine tweezers, grasp the tick by the head and pull it gently but firmly straight up. Do not handle the tick with your fingers. Injuries from marine animals. Uh, Coelenterates uh, are responsible for more envenomations than any other marine animals. The stinging cells of the coelenterates are called nematocysts. Nemat Nematocysts. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Sounds good enough to me. I'm trying, y'all. I'm struggling. I'm so tired, and my voice is. Like, I'm struggling. Uh, large animals may discharge hundreds of thousands of them. Systemic symptoms include headache, dizziness, muscle cramps, and fainting. To treat the sting of the from the tentacles of a jellyfish, remove the patient from the water and remove the tentacles by scraping them off with the edge of a stiff object. Wash the affected area with vinegar immediately, if available, for at least 30 seconds. Limit further discharge of the nematosis by avoiding fresh water. Reduce motion of the affected extremity. Persistent pain may respond to immersion of the area in hot water for 30 minutes. Um, Wait, so if we get some of our I can't You can, actually you can, and this is what I'm gonna explain to you. Um, the nematos, nematocysts, the stinging part of these critters, um, they're used to being in the ocean, okay? So when they hit you and you, you pull them out of the water, that's when they start firing because now they're out of their environment. So people tell you to pee on it because your pee is salty. So the, quote, salt water of the urine will make them quit stinging you. However, comma, you have a risk of infection. So um, if you, you have to scrape the stinger, all the little stingy things off, um, baking soda will deactivate them. Uh, worst case scenario, get a bucket of salt water from the ocean and pour that on it, soak that on it, because it tricks it thinking that it's back in the water and it'll quit stinging. Um, so yes, you can pee on it, but then you're probably gonna need an antibiotic. I've always just heard like if you get stung, just 
Yeah, that's what people say. And it will work. It'll make them quit stinging you, but you're going to get an infection. Fun fact. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah. A patient may have a systemic allergic reaction to the sting of one of these animals. Treat such a patient for anaphylactic shock. Toxins from the spines of urchins, stingrays, and certain spiny fish are heat sensitive. Table 34.6 lists the common marine animal envenomations. The best treatment is to immobilize the affected area and soak it in hot water for 30 minutes. If you work near the ocean, you should be familiar with the marine life in your area.